Hello, my name is Joshua Jolisaint, and I have the opportunity to interview Dr. William Jarnigan for the July edition of the Mentor of the Month interview series. He is the chief of the Hepatopancreato Biliary Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and holds the Leslie Blumgart Chair in Surgery. Dr. Jarnigan, thank you so much for agreeing to participate in the SSAT Mentor of the Month series and for your time. Thanks for inviting me. For our first question, can you describe your training path in surgery up to this point, including the influence and experience of training under Dr. Leslie Bloomgard? Sure. Um, uh, so my, my, my interest in, in HPV surgery began, I think, probably even in medical school. I, I had an interest in liver physiology, pathophysiology, uh, even, even at that point. And that interest uh, grew during my residency training. Uh, during my research years, I spent uh, uh, in a uh, liver basic science laboratory studying the, the mechanisms of liver fibrosis. Um, and that uh, you know, led me to pursue a career in, um, in HPB. Um, I, you know, I, I, when I was a medical student, uh, it was at, at the time, around the time of uh, that liver transplant was just emerging as a, as a viable treatment, uh, treatment option for patients and, and was very intrigued by that. But I, um, it, I didn't feel that a transplant was the right fit for me in terms of my interest in, uh, in liver diseases per se, not just that were amenable to transplant, but, uh, but also to, uh, you know, resectional therapies and, uh, and, and other things. So, so that kind of got me interested in a, in a career in HPV. Um, and training uh, under Leslie Bloomgard was uh, certainly uh, one of the most uh, important uh, uh, parts of my career. Uh, it was uh, uh, very much a career changing event. Um, you know, because in, until that time, my, my exposure to liver surgery was really, even though I've worked with many surgeons who did liver surgery, um, you know, Dr. Bloomgard was one of the people who, who founded the entire field. He was, he was one of the early pioneers. Um, and when I got here, it was clear that he did things uh, in, you know, with liver surgery that, that I had never even heard of before, never seen before. Um, there is a um, there's a section in Plato's Republic that deals with education, and about uh, uh, people who live in a dark underground den, who only see the shadows of reality. And the educational process involves dragging them out of the darkness and into the light. And 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 in doing so, it's painful. Uh, and the, at times, training under Dr. Bloomgart was a little bit painful, but uh, but mostly it was a very much an eye opening experience and 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 a, and a um, period of time that uh, completely changed my career. So it was, it was a fabulous experience. Great. And how has hepatobiliary training changed since you were a fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering? And what is your philosophy for training the current generation of surgeons? Um, so the, the training in many ways has, you know, is the same. Um, you know, fellows, fellows come here for, um, largely clinical experience uh, and learning not, not just how to operate because honestly um, it, it, you can teach anybody how to do an operation, um, but that's a big part of it. These are often complex procedures and, and learning how to do them and do them well is an important part of the training. But an uh, even bigger part uh, has to be you know, training fellows about how to think about uh, the diseases that we operate on, about the biology of the cancers which we, we treat, which is you know, largely what we deal with, um, and training fellows, uh, uh, trying to tr train them and show them when not to operate is probably the hardest uh, part of the training. So, um, you know, so in many ways, that hasn't changed uh, over the years. Um, you know, what has changed is, you know, we, we are increasingly getting better understanding of disease biology. And so that has to factor into our decisions about when to operate. Um, you know, there are, more, there are more things to think about. You know, there, there are more chemotherapy agents available. There are more non-surgical treatments potentially available. 
Uh, so these things all have to be factored into the decisions about when to operate and when not to, et cetera. Um, so, um, you know, and, and the, the results that we're getting uh, in, with surgery are also improving, which uh, is another factor in, in trying to decide when, when the right time to operate or if it's a, 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 ever a right time. So, you know, the, 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 surger, the surgical training part uh, is, is not changed very much. In, in that we're, we're teaching fellows, training them how to be good surgeons when we do cases in the operating room. Um, but a lot more to think about in terms of the biology of the, the diseases and, and thinking about all of the factors that contribute to, to control of the cancer and long-term survival. One of your research and clinical interests is in cholangiocarcinoma. How did you build such a specialized practice and what is the next advancement that you foresee in the management of this very rare disease? So, you know, it certainly helps uh, if you have an interest in a disease that's not common to, to work at a place like Sloan Kettering, uh, where um, we do see a large volume of these uncommon diseases. And, you know, it helped to, to be with Dr. Bloomgard, who also had a similar interest and attracted a lot of um, patients uh, to come uh, uh, to be evaluated by him. Um, so, so that's a big part of it. The environment has a big part to play. Um, and certainly uh, surrounding yourself with people who have similar interests um, certainly helps. Um, but, you know, also, uh, you know, publishing uh, early on in, in, in your career in this area, uh, you know, gets, get your name associated with uh, with the disease or with the, with this um, uh, issue, and so people start to see you as someone who, you know, not only has a research interest but probably has a clinical interest in it as well, and that that tends to generate, you know, referral clinical referrals, um, and uh, you know you make it known to patient to referring doctors that this is something that you uh, have an interest in as well. Um, so it's, it's a process. It takes time. It certainly doesn't happen overnight uh, by any means. Um, but, uh, but, but I think you know, the, the biggest issue is the environment that you're in and, and, uh, and, and the people around you who can help support you uh, uh, pursue the, the interests that you have. Along those lines, you have an extensive track record both in clinical trials and translational research. How did you become, a success, become successful as an investigator for high-impact surgical research while maintaining your clinical practice? So that's, you know, that's a good question. And uh, it, it's, you know, anyone who, uh, you know, wishes to, to, to practice surgery, uh, uh, at, you know, at, at, a, at a high level and, uh, and be a busy clinical surgeon and do, you know, a, a meaningful research um, certainly knows then it's a tough balance to strike. Um, you know, I was told early on that you need to make time for, for setting up a research program early on in, in your career because the clinical practice um, can get busy very fast. Um, you know, referring doctors are always looking for um, good surgeons who will provide good care for their patients. And once, once you have that reputation, uh, the clinical floodgates will open, and it, it becomes difficult to control. Um, and and all of a sudden, now the time you set aside for research uh, is gone, um, is taken up by clinical work. So I think for young surgeons, I would say you, you know you need to try and keep the clinical work at bay a little bit until you set up uh, uh, have time to set up your research program, whether whether it's a, in a laboratory or translational work or um, whether it's uh, you know clin clinical research, um, and again the environment is very important for this. You know having the support of your uh, of your chairman uh, and other members of your department, your group, uh, uh, to help make sure that you have that protected time, uh, that they uh, um, you know that they uh, support what you do and and uh, and give you the you know the encouragement and the resources. Um, so again, once again, the environment is 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 key. Um, and, you know, again, it's another thing that takes patience and, and persistence and uh, a lot of pushing. It, uh, you know, not something that, that happens immediately, but something that will happen if you really want to pursue it. You just have to, uh, you just have to keep, keep pushing and not let 
obstacles get in your way. Thank you so much. And for our last question, what do you consider your most meaningful accomplishment in surgery? Well, I, I, you know, I have to say that uh, the most meaningful and most important uh, accomplishment for me has been the training of uh, the next generation of, of surgeons. Um, you know, I think all of us, you know, in surgery have benefited from the people who have gone before us, our, our, tra our mentors, you know, Dr. Blumgart, you know, here at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, other mentors from my general surgery training, Dr. Uh, William Schechter, Lawrence Way, Nancy Asher. Um, you know, these are you know many legendary uh, figures in the field, and we benefited from their teaching um, and their experience, showing us how to how to be doc good doctors, good surgeons, and it's a real pleasure to be able to do that for younger surgeons coming through as fellows and residents here and to watch many of them go on to very successful careers and in fact to be even more successful than we we've been so that's that's the i think my greatest pleasure um so great thank you so much dr jarn again for taking the time to speak with us thanks josh for inviting me